Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about matrices, vectors and related stuff. And now in today's part 59, we will continue our journey with complex matrices by introducing the so-called adjoint matrix. This one is completely related to the transpose matrix we have already introduced in former videos. However, before we start with the new definition, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube, on Patreon or by other means. Indeed, your support makes it possible that I can create videos about interesting mathematical facts. And since I also want you to practice a lot of mathematics, you find additional material to this course with the link in the description. Ok, then without further ado, let's start with the topic of today by recalling the inner product in Rn and Cn. In fact, both are denoted with these pointy brackets, but they are a little bit different in their particular definition. Namely, in the real case, we just have to multiply the components and sum them up afterwards. So you see, this is not so complicated, you just have to use the multiplication in R and the addition in R. Of course, this means in Cn we use the corresponding operations in C. However, there is one important fact you should never forget while calculating in Cn. Namely, there is a complex conjugation involved as well. And usually we set this to the first entry in the inner product. So in this case the vector x gets the complex conjugation in each component. However, here I have to say that sometimes some authors use the complex conjugation on the second argument. In other words, they use a different definition for the inner product for their calculations. This does not change so much of course, but it's important to keep in mind if you see some formulas with an inner product. Ok, but in this video course here I want to use the complex conjugation in the first argument. So please remember that. Ok, and now we can talk a little bit about the transpose in Rn. Indeed, we have learned that the transpose of a matrix fulfills a very nice property inside the inner product. Namely, if you have a matrix A inside the inner product here, you can shift it to the other argument. This means you could shift it to X instead of Y. However, if you do that, the transpose comes to that place. Moreover, you might remember that this could also act as a possible definition for the transpose matrix. However, of course this formula here is not complicated at all, we could immediately prove it by using the definition from above. So you see, here on the left hand side, what we need is the kth component of the matrix vector product. However, this is not a problem at all, because we know that the matrix vector product can be written by using the components. This means here we also have to sum over the index j. And now we just have ordinary real numbers, which means we could shift this number to the front. And now in order to write this as a matrix vector product again, we have to exchange the two indices here. And of course, this is exactly what the transpose matrix does. So you know, it just exchanges rows and columns. Ok, and with that we have it, there you see, this is exactly what we wanted. Ok, and now the natural question is of course, can we do the same in Cn now? And obviously, this should not be a problem, because we can write down a similar calculation as before. The only difference here is that now the components of x have a complex conjugation. And we immediately see that does not change anything with the matrix vector product with the vector y here. However, it changes something if we want to push this entry akj to the components of x. Because then, if we want to rewrite that as a matrix vector product as before, we first have to exchange the entries, the indices as before, but we also have to add a complex conjugation. This means we can use the entries of AT, but we also need the complex conjugation on them. This is needed because we know we have the complex conjugation on the whole first entry of the inner product. So only by doing that, we can write the inner product now with the matrix A in the first argument. However, it's not the matrix A and also not the transpose as before, it's a so-called adjoint. And the notation I use for the adjoint matrix is a star. 
There are also other notations some authors use if the star is not a good choice, but for us here the star is a very good notation. So if you see a star on a matrix, it means it's the adjoint matrix of the matrix A. However, there are also other names for this adjoint matrix and often it's called the conjugate transpose. And by the calculation above, you also see why this is also a good name for that. Okay, so now I would say, let's put that what we know into a formal definition. So for any complex matrix, where the components are complex numbers and written with lowercase a's, this means we have a11, a12, a13 and so on. And of course we have that for each row and the last element here would be amn. So this is something you already know well enough. The only difference is now that we have complex numbers as entries. And now for this matrix, we define a new one called a star. And now you already know what to do. We exchange rows and columns and also use the complex conjugate. This means each entry here gets a line on top. So not so complicated at all if you already know the transpose. Indeed, this is also a very important fact of the adjoint. The numbers of rows and columns changes. More precisely, this is now an n times m matrix. And I already told you, the new matrix here we call the adjoint matrix of A. But don't forget, there are also other names around, for example conjugate transpose or a Hermitian conjugate. And because of the last name, you sometimes also see a capital H instead of a star in the notation. Okay, now before we go back to the eigenvalues, let's do a very quick example. Of course, it could definitely happen that your complex matrix only has real numbers as entries. Then, in this case, of course, the adjoint matrix is the same as the transpose. But still, if we calculate inside the complex realm, the star notation is still the correct one. But otherwise, the whole calculation here is very simple. Therefore, it might be more interesting if we look at an actual complex example. So complex but not complicated, which means we should put in some i's. So you see, what we can do is something like that. So this is a 2 times 3 matrix, which means that a star is now a 3 times 2 matrix. And the first element is now not i, but minus i, the complex conjugate. And of course, that's how it works with the other i's as well. So what you do is you do the transpose as usual, and then you use the complex conjugation in each entry. So you see, it's a nice calculation scheme, but you already know the importance of the adjoint matrix comes from the inner product in Cn. So that's something I have to stress out. This is what you need to remember in this linear algebra course. For the inner product, we have two cases, either the real case or the complex case. And indeed, they are so similar that sometimes one only writes the complex case as the general case. However, since we go step by step, we want to distinguish both cases. So now we know the standard inner product in Rn can be written as xty. So using the transpose on the column vector x makes it to a row vector and we have the matrix vector multiplication here. And the result is a 1 times 1 matrix, which we interpret as a real number. And now indeed, the same we can do with the complex case, where we use the adjoint instead of the transpose. This means with our new notations, the standard inner product in Cn is given as x star y. And again, you can see it as a matrix product, where the result is a complex number. So I would say, this makes your life easier to remember the standard inner product in Rn and in Cn. However, please don't forget, this is the standard inner product, so there are also other possibilities to define so-called inner products. Indeed, that's maybe something we will do later in this course. However, at the moment we are still talking about eigenvalues, so the next proposition will be about that. More precisely, I want to tell you what the spectrum of the adjoint matrix is. So this is the set of all eigenvalues and they are related to the eigenvalues of A. And this might not surprise you, A star and A have almost the same eigenvalues. This means here I go with lambda through all eigenvalues of A. 
And then we get the eigenvalues of a star if I use the complex conjugation on lambda. And indeed, that's it. That's the only difference for the eigenvalues of a and a star. So in the complex plane, this means if these are the eigenvalues of a, then reflected with respect to the real axis here, you find the eigenvalues of a star. In particular, they definitely share eigenvalues on the real axis here. In fact, it's not hard to prove this equation here because you already know the eigenvalues are the zeros of the characteristic polynomial. So you only have to check how the zeros change if you include the complex conjugation in the entries of the matrix. So I would say this is a good exercise I can leave for you. But of course, you can use the comments to explain your solution. Otherwise, I would say let's meet in the next video where we will discuss some special matrices and their eigenvalues. So I hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.